Hello Church, welcome to this week's message. My name is Henry Loke. This is God's Feeding Station. It's an honor to be with you again this week. We are continuing in Romans. We're winding it down here. We're in uh, chapter 15, verses 14 through 21. Today's message is inspired more by what I read in various commentaries and studying up for this week rather than Romans itself. And I'll explain that here when we get there. But the title today is, What Do We See? And the question is, what do we see or what do we think of others? When we see others and then as I thought more about this, it's like when we read one of their tweets or we see a post that they make on Facebook or we hear something they said or we see something about them on the news. What do we think of them? What do we see? Because remember, Paul had no personal interaction with the church in Rome. Everything he knows about them is through either letters written to him or stories brought back to him from people who had been there. So he really has had no personal interaction with them. And so how does he see them? How do you think he sees them in knowing what we've gone over here over the last few months? Because I was thinking about going back to a time in my past where I've been chastised a lot, uh, chastised a lot for always wanting to see the best in everybody. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. My problem was I would put them on a pedestal of sorts and not like idol worship kind of thing, but just kind of, you know, go on first impressions, put them up here. And then when they would fall off, as we all do, because we all fall short, the disappointment would be that much worse. And so there's got to be some spiritual discernment that keeps us grounded when we're looking at people. But that being said, I'm going to read the scripture in and then we're going to, we're going to talk about this some more. So beginning at verse 14, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. But on some points, I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see and those who have never heard will understand. Now again, Paul has, you could say Paul has taken some liberties in chastising Rome in a very humble way, but pointing out, hey, here's some issues you guys have to deal with and having never met them. But the thing with Paul is, he does everything, he writes everything, he communicates everything he does to the church here in Rome because first and foremost, he's about Christ and bringing others to him. That is his first priority and it has been since he came face to face with Jesus on the road to Damascus. And he's gone from persecution of the church to salvation and bringing others into the church. It's quite I mean, if there's ever was a 180, this is it. And he can do this because Paul now sees as Christ sees. He's much more interested in what someone has the ability to become in Christ than where 
that person is at presently. He sees with discernment. He sees with the eyes and the heart of Christ. And when he corrects and when he admonishes, he does so out of love and humility. He doesn't do it with this authoritarian attitude. Right? I established you as a church. I'm your leader. I'm th thus, I'm going to beat you over the head with the word. And I'm going to, you know, the beatings will continue until morale improves kind of thing. He doesn't do that. He does so out of a genuine caring and love for their well-being. And it's just as Jesus did. I often say, you know, if there was ever a disciple and an example of Christ in others in the Bible, it's Paul. Because look at how Jesus dealt with those he came in contact with. Think about the woman at the well. Think about the woman caught in adultery. Think about the leper. Think about how he dealt, even with the religious leaders, when they kept coming after him over and over and over and over again. Think of his response when he's condemned by the religious leaders for eating and keeping company with what they labeled as sinners. And what the religious leaders, I think, failed to understand is the sin within themselves. But what was Jesus' response? Jesus' response was, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the sick. Right? Jesus came for the lost sheep of Israel. Right? He was their shepherd. He came to heal them physically and spiritually. He is the great physician. And that's how Paul sees them. Right? Jesus had this ability to look past the sins, to look past the worldly outer coating and get to literally the heart of the matter in people. Jesus saw them with the potential to be saved. And that was his goal. What did he come to do? He came to save. He came to serve, not to be served. He came to carry out the mission of the plan of salvation that God had put in place before the creation of the world. How many times have you heard me say that this year? But that's why Jesus came. But if Jesus would have seen as the world sees, he could have gotten very frustrated. He could have thought, why bother? He could have thought, man, these people are idiots. They don't get it. Why, why am I here? But he didn't see that. He saw people as God sees them. He saw people in the design of the Creator. God created us to have a relationship with Him. Sin got in the way. Jesus says, okay, that sin needs to be dealt with. I'm going to deal with that. And he saw people in that light of having a relationship with God, in that understanding of once this sin is removed, and it's, I shouldn't say it's removed, it's, it's, it's dealt with, right? It's dealt with because we continue to sin, don't we? Once that sin is dealt with and the path is cleared now to the Holy of Holies, look at the potential these people have. Take the disciples. Like I see them as 12 teenagers, 12 young men. And when you look at how rabbis operated in that time and place, their students were younger. They weren't older men. They weren't grown men. They were kids looking to learn from a mentor. And think about how do we see teenagers these days? <laughs> Right? I, you know, and I, I speak from experience because I deal with them, you know, four or five times a week in coaching. And how do, but how do we see them? Do, these, do we see them with the potential that God has placed in them? Or do we see them as just young kids who don't know squat about squat? But, the, the, but those are the questions we have to answer because that can translate into how we see adults. And again, you know, the political, you know, pinging on the political is easy fodder right now. 
But you know, when you see somebody post something on, on social media that you don't agree with, how do you think of that person? Can you get past that little snapshot of a post? Or do you make a judgment about them based on, on what they've written and what they posted or what, what they've copied and, 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 and posted on, on social media? It's a really interesting question. Jesus saw past that. There is no possible way Jesus would have been able to heal a leper if all he looked at was the outer shell. But he loved people for who they were. And he saw their potential. He saw them as God saw them. His children. People, God desires to be saved because that's what God's about. Restoring the relationship, restoring that walking in the cool of the evening relationship. And that's how Jesus saw them. That's how Paul sees them. Paul sees them the same way. He loves them the same way. And he calls himself the servant of Christ. The word used here in the ancient language is the word that we get liturgies from. And it means people who showed uh, great patriotism and great love of country, so much so that they would volunteer to incur the cost of various things that involved their nation, whether it was, you know, the big games, you know, and the akin to our Olympics kind of thing. They would sponsor athletes, or if there was a, a gathering of the nations for, or a gathering of the peoples for whatever reason, some kind of festival or some kind of meeting of the minds or whatever it was, they would incur the cost of providing for the people coming in for the meals and for their lodging. They would incur that cost or they would incur the cost of the expenses of something like a warship for an entire year to maintain that warship for an entire year. They would incur that cost and they would do it out of what they felt was their patriotism, their love, their duty for their country. And that's the word that Paul uses here for this servant, right? It's a generous servant, uh, a generous service done voluntarily. Well, Paul generously volunteered all he had for the gospel of Christ so that others would come to know him as Paul has come to know him. DL, uh, there's a story about D.L. Moody uh, who heard a pastor say, if only one man would give himself entirely and without reserve to the Holy Spirit, what that spirit might do with them. And D.L. Moody heard that and thought, well, why not me? Why not me? And we know the ministry that D.L. Moody had, right? That's humility. That's humility to come to a point of understanding of there is so much more that I could do if I would just get myself out of the way. If I would just let the Spirit work in me and through me, if I would just surrender it all to God. There's a little bit of fear in that, isn't there? That's a scary thing to give up control. I speak from vast experience. Ask the people who know me, right? I'm a control freak. I have to know the whys and the hows and you know, it's probably why I coach, because I have control, right? But we have to give that up. If we want to realize our true potential as God sees us, we have to give that up. We have to surrender that. God, use me as you will. I tell the story often of uh, Pastor Doug had prayed at one point just because it, there was a lot of things coming at him. He's like, God, just put me in the fire and burn all the flesh off so that, that all that's left is, is the spirit. Then you get what he was saying. Get rid of all the worldly stuff so that I can just concentrate, concentrate on the, the vertical instead of the horizontal. But that's a scary thing. That's a scary, for me, that's a scary thing to pray because God can bring some hard times, right? Ask Job. Ask Job about being put in the fire or ask Paul or ask Jesus or ask Ruth or countless others who, who went through some really tough times 
and came out of it spiritually so far ahead, but in the midst of it, man, it's tough. But are we willing to do that? Are we willing to lay ourselves on the altar of sacrifice and say, okay, God, use me as you see fit and do what needs to be done? But that's humility, right? To think less of oneself than we probably do, especially less of oneself than we think of others. Right? We, we're not, we don't have the ability to see others as Jesus sees them if we think very highly of ourselves, right? If we think, I've got it all sussed, I've got it all figured out. If that's my attitude, then God can't use me. And Paul understood this. And Paul understood that the power to do what he was being asked to do had to come from somewhere else other than himself. He understood where that power came from and he gave all honor and glory to God for his ministry. So the other question here then is, who are we in this for? And why are we in this? Why have a faith? Is it just for ourselves? Is it just to make sure that I get to heaven? Or is it, and I think, you know, for yourself is a good reason. Trust me, I'm not, you know, I'm not advocating the lake of fire for anybody, right, as an option. I mean, those, those who refuse Christ are, are, that's where things are headed, but that's not my decision. I would not recommend that for anybody. So having that, that personal vested interest is a good thing, but what else? What else? Right? Do we care for others to have some of these hard discussions in love and humility that Paul had? Because Scripture tells us what God's about. God's about salvation. Why else would he do the things that he did or allow the things that he allowed? Why do we think, I always bring this up, but why do we think he exiled Israel to Babylon and to Assyria? Why did he do that? There was judgment, obviously, for their idolatry, but there's a bigger reason. Isn't there? Is there not a bigger reason? The bigger reason is to get them to turn and repent and come back to him, right? To get their spiritual act together. That's why he allows the things he allows in our lives to help us get our spiritual act together, to grow in faith and obedience to him because there are things that need to be done there are blessings he would love to bestow on us. There are other people that need to be saved and need to be brought the knowledge of Christ to. Who's gonna do that? Who's tasked with doing that? We are. We are. Make, go and make disciples of all nations. Right, so if we're going to bring, bring Christ to others, we have to want it for them like we want it for ourselves. It has, their salvation has to be as important to me as mine is. Because just as it's a matter of life and death for me, it's a matter of life and death for them. And so we have to have that desire for them to find Christ just like God does, right? And what is the length and depth and breadth of God's concern for us to the point that he gave his only son. That's the depth of God's love and grace for us, his desire for us to be reconciled to him. So to bring them a knowledge of salvation, a knowledge of Christ, to, to help them understand how God has laid this all out, we have to see them as God sees them. We have to see them as Jesus sees them. We have to see them as Paul saw them, right? We have to have a heart of flesh, not a heart of stone for our fellow man. It's gotta be a heart of flesh. And it's gotta be a heart that desires 
the very best for them. And the very best for them, it doesn't get any better than the salvation in Christ.